so let's begin the evening proper now, as it were. So, as you might recall, our overarching theme uh, for this for this series is tools for building a sustainable practice. And we're looking at that in the light of the five spiritual faculties. So let me share that with you. So hopefully you can see there the uh, diagram, which in one of two different forms, hopefully we'll have some familiarity for you now. So um, we have our old friend mindfulness in the center there, and then uh, vigor at the top, concentration at the bottom, faith on the left, and wisdom on the right. And I'm going to say a bit more about that later. And as a part of this, this drive, um, over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at this in the light of 20 suggestions for dealing with overwhelm. So this is the 20 suggestions for dealing with overwhelm was created by Vasantra. And as Narvir mentioned, there's a link in the chat to Vasantra's website where the article on the 20 suggestions is. So what are these 20 suggestions? That's really what I'm going to introduce this evening. One thing I should mention as well that um, was also following on from the feedback that you gave us a few weeks ago. One of the things that you wanted was more time, more meditation. So we've decided that uh, this evening we're not going to have a formal break. So instead, if you want to take a comfort break or you want to grab yourself a glass of water or something, just go ahead and do it and, um, and we'll carry on without you. So, um, yeah, we're not going to have a formal break uh, and we'll see how that goes, see how, uh, see how we feel about that. So what are the 20 suggestions for dealing uh, with overwhelm? Well, let's start with the circumstances by which they came about. So Vitantra originally wrote them um, this article in 2018, but it's based on a previous work of his from 2016. So it's, it's, you know, the last, within the last five years, really. And it came about because of a number of issues. Climate change being probably prime amongst them. And then various other ancillary uh, concerns related to climate change, such as the extinction of species, and the deterioration of wildlife and uh, environments. But then there's also things like terrorism, refugee crises, drought, flood, extreme weather conditions, famine, the rise of populist movements, radical changes to the established world order. You could make your own list. We all could have our favourites. And of course, this was all before the global pandemic. Now, we did talk about this a couple of years ago at the centre, and as, as was pointed out at the time, there is an ebb and, and flow of world affairs. Things come and go. Crises arise and then go away or are overshadowed or are resolved. Every age has its challenges. I grew up during the Cold War, where we had uh, such uh, delightful things as the threat of mutually assured destruction. There were a couple of occasions when the planet really was on the brink of nuclear war. And that was a really, a very real fear uh, during my school days. 
My parents grew up during World War II. Imagine the terror of growing up during the Blitz, of being bombed. When your country was on the brink of invasion by a ruthless, evil enemy. Well, it must have been absolutely terrifying. And before that, of course, there was World War I, various other wars, high infant mortality, disease, hunger, a life of hard work and drudgery, poor health care, and no agency. Some of these history programmes you see on the TV, it strikes me just how hard people had to work years ago, or most people had to work anyway. And, and you had no agency. You couldn't change anything. You couldn't, you know, go and study at university and become a doctor or something like that. It's, uh, you were stuck with it. And then you died. You know, that, was, that was basically it. So we shouldn't feel too sorry for ourselves, perhaps. We have many positive things about being born and living in this age. Many wonderful things. But nevertheless, we feel what we feel. Emotions are what they are. And many people are feeling a sense of overwhelm. Perhaps the 24 hour news exacerbates this. Digging into every corner and every country, all this news comes flowing back to us only a small proportion of which tends to be positive news. It's a bit different, you know, this 24 hour rolling news that we have now from, remember that was that, uh, you might have heard there was that famous occasion on the 18th of April, 1930, when there was no news. They had the, uh, the evening news come on and they just had to say, oh, today we have no news. And they just played uh, piano music for the rest of the, uh, 15 minute slot. You wouldn't get that now, would you? So, um, overwhelm. So what is overwhelm? And why are people feeling it? I'm going to quote the Santra now from his article, because I think he puts it very well. So let's begin by acknowledging that it's wonderful that we care that we are concerned about problems like the refugee crisis, warfare, climate change, and so on. We do have good hearts and we want to respond to these situations. However, sadly, we can sometimes end up feeling paralyzed by them and unable to respond effectively. Why is this? It seems to me that much of our society suffers from a kind of deadly duo of low self-esteem in relation to ourselves and horrified anxiety in relation to what is happening in the world. That's a very unfortunate combination. It easily leads us to feel powerless. For what could someone like me ever do about all this? The everyday manifestation of this is often a feeling of being overwhelmed. This tendency to overwhelm seems so common these days, even among Buddhist practitioners. So, as I said, this was written in 2018 based on an early article from 2016. And it seemed very timely. And certainly for me, it felt very timely. For me, there was this uh, disappointment. And, as, and I, yeah, I would acknowledge a sense of overwhelm at times. And I think partly from my point of view, there was, this was as a result of um, disappointment following the optimism of the late 1990s. So at the end of the 1990s, we had the end of the Cold War, we had progressive governments, totalitarianism, 
had been defeated, it seemed, or at least was retreating. There was a decline in terrorism. There were still problems, of course. But the 21st century seemed to offer a path to progress. We seem to be heading in a positive direction, by and large. So the situation that we find ourselves in, in 2016, 2018, 2021, was not supposed to be like this. Disappointing. So as I mentioned, I gave a couple of talks on this in 2019. And as some people come out, commented, wars do indeed come and go. And compared to the death toll from wars in the previous century, the death toll is quite very low, in fact, from warfare these days. Even floods and famine are episodic. This eternal sea I've mentioned previously, everything changing, yet everything is the same. But climate change did seem different. There is this positive feedback, not positive in the sense of being good, but in the sense of one bad thing leading and exacerbating another bad thing, which in turn leads to another bad thing. So you have this spiral. We have had some progress over the last couple of years, since my last couple of talks, I think. The amount of electric cars, Certainly the amount of electric car adverts on the TV is uh, hugely more than it used to be. Various undertakings from countries and companies to become carbon neutral. A greater knowledge and a greater acceptance of the reality of climate change. Certainly if the polls are anything to go by. And I think climate deniers, climate change deniers have really pretty much been defeated now. But the underlying problems largely remain. Not much has actually been achieved. And my talks two years ago, of course, since then, there's been 2020. A year like no other for almost everybody on the planet. with COVID-19, of course, the, uh, and the mental health concerns due to COVID-19. The worry about the virus itself, the worry about work or income, education, unemployment, significant changes to our lifestyle, isolation, lack of human contact, lack of socialization and communication. And then you've got the disruption of the usual mental health support network on top of that. So this was largely why we decided to revisit the 20 suggestions for dealing with overwhelm. It seemed like a good time. So what are these suggestions? Well, we are going to look at them over the coming weeks, but I'll just quickly go through them now. So one, be aware of how much you take in of what is disturbing. Two, do whatever you need to help you stay resourced and balanced. Three, be mindful of social media. Four, make sure you stay well grounded. Five, look out for the near enemies of compassion. Six, watch out for irrational guilt. Seven, hold in your heart the wish for suffering to come to an end. Eight, let your heart break. Nine, work in your sphere of influence. Ten, empathise with, with the perpetrators as well as the victims. Eleven, work on the inner as well as the outer level. 12. Entrust the situation to deeper forces. 13. 
check your expectations about life in the light of the Dharma. 14. Do your best to let go of hopes and fears about outcomes. 15. Use the wishing prayer that dispels hope and fear. 16. Equanimity comes from reflecting that everyone has their own karma. 17. Think one at a time. 18. Use short pieces of dharma to help anchor you. 19. Being part of a community and having spiritual friends is crucial. 20. The ultimate solution to overwhelm is awareness of emptiness. So there's much to unpack there, some perhaps more than others. Some are quite simple, practical advice like be more mindful, be mindful on social media. Some are suggestions that are faith dependent and or require some exploration, such as let your heart break. But it's real practical dharma, I feel. The Buddha's teachings brought to bear on our 21st century situation. Now let's remind ourselves of the five spiritual faculties again. Faith and wisdom, concentration and energy in pursuit of the good, mindfulness. So bear them in mind as I repeat the 20 suggestions once more. One, be aware of how much you take in of what is disturbing. Two, do whatever you need to help you stay resourced and balanced. Three, be mindful on social media. Four, make sure you stay well grounded. Five, look out for the near enemies of compassion. Six, watch out for irrational guilt. Seven, hold in your heart the wish for suffering to come to an end. Eight, let your heart break. Nine, Work in your sphere of influence. 10. Empathize with the perpetrators as well as the victims. 11. Work on the inner as well as the outer level. 12. Entrust the situation to deeper forces. 13. Check your expectations about life in the light of the Dharma. 14. Do your best to let go of hopes and fears about outcomes. 15. Use the, wish pre use the wishing prayer that dispels hope and fear. 16. Equanimity comes from reflecting that everyone has their own karma. 17. Think one at a time. 18. Use short pieces of dharma to help anchor you. 19. Being part of a community and having spiritual friends is crucial. 20. The ultimate solution to overwhelm is awareness of emptiness. So over five weeks, we will look at the 20 suggestions in the light of each of the five spiritual faculties in turn. We are often told or advised that we should cherish each day, each ordinary day. Happiness, joy, contentment are ultimately found 
in the here and now, in the very moment, even the very ordinary moment. And to seek happiness elsewhere is to leave it behind. But how then does that compare or contrast with the sadness or even despair we feel at the events of the modern world and with our fears for the future? Is this indeed one of the conditions that lead us to overwhelm? a strain within us that arises from the stress of the modern world with apparently a limited ability to do much about it. As touched on before, in some senses, twas ever thus. The Buddha, of course, himself lived in a land and a time where disease was rampant, warfare commonplace. So bringing us back to the 20 suggestions for dealing with overwhelm. How can we marry our Buddhist aspirations with the reality in which we live? More specifically, how can we seek contentment when there is so much that calls out for our empathy? And so over five weeks, although not concurrent weeks, we will be exploring these suggestions in the light of the five spiritual faculties to see how the Buddha's teachings can be brought to bear on the challenges our modern Buddhist faces. So just looking at these five spiritual faculties once more, what you notice is that uh, each of the English terms has got a funny Sanskrit term as well, in brackets, which you might wonder why we bother. And um, isn't it just confusing? Well, that, it possibly is a bit confusing at first, but... Um, it's actually very important, I think, the, the Sanskrit terms, and it helps to avoid misunderstanding. Because with these five spiritual faculties, we're talking a bit about really quite specific things that the English word may not necessarily convey. So looking at mindfulness in the center first, Shmirti, perhaps this is the most straightforward of the five in some way. It gives us a clue, doesn't it, with the English word, having our mind full of something. Shmirti means really calling to mind something. So I think we can get the idea of what we're alluding to there. Then we have vigor or virya. Now you often see this as energy or energy in pursuit of the good. I must admit, I quite like the word vigor. It takes us back, it has the same root as virya, as uh, English and uh, Sanskrit have common roots as languages. The same root says the words uh, for li living in life in French or Spanish, Italian. And so it has that feel of liveliness to it, I think, vigor. It means, though, energy, not just um, energy in, in an ordinary sense of the word, but energy in pursuit of the good. I also, I think it's probably possibly because I come from a, a physics background. I did quite a bit of physics um, as a part of um, uh, my studying. And energy means quite something quite specific in physics. Um, nothing at all to do with Buddhism. So, so I quite like uh, the word vigor or virya. So it's not just about being energetic. It's not just energy. It's not just running a marathon or working all day or something like that. It's energy in pursuit of the good. I remember when I was quite young, I, I lived in this little village 
And uh, I was quite struck because there were a few quite well-to-do people in the, uh, in the village. And I saw one of the kind of well-to-do guys one day in the churchyard mowing, mowing the churchyard, which is quite a lot of work to do. It's quite, you know, it's quite a lot of grass to mow in the churchyard. And even though I was quite young, I must admit I was quite impressed by this because this guy could have easily paid somebody to do that if he wanted, or he, or easily just not done anything at all. But here he was giving up his Sunday afternoon to come along and mow the um, the churchyard. And I thought this was quite commendable, really. And that, that came to my mind as being an example of energy in pursuit of the good. So balancing that, we might say, or, or contrasting that, or working hand in hand with that, we have concentration or samadhi. So this isn't just concentration in, in you know, any old sense of the word. It's specifically about meditative absorption. Um, and so, again, we'll be hearing more about this. So it's not just ordinary, everyday concentration. Similarly with faith, faith is quite a, well, it's quite a word, isn't it, in some ways? What does faith mean? And I think that's why it's particularly important, if possible, to, to know that we're talking about shraddha, which has a particular meaning. We are not talking about blind faith. We are not talking about faith in ignorance of the facts, saying that evolution can't possibly have happened because our holy book says it didn't, insisting that, you know, Adam and Eve must have happened because our holy book said it did. That is not Shraddha. Shraddha instead is an intuitive response. It's a confidence that are aligned with the known facts, but it's also an emotional response. And then we come to wisdom or pranya. And again, wisdom is quite a, um, a wide ranging word. It can be, mean lots of different things from being streetwise or uh, the wisdom of the ages or uh, the wise woman, or, or the wise, you know, crops up in quite a lot of uh, contexts. But we're talking about pranya, Buddhist wisdom, which is understanding the way things actually are and behaving in the light of this, in accord with reality. So we can understand intellectually, we could read a Buddhist book and we could hear, we could take it in, memorize it, repeat it, pass an exam on it perhaps. Doesn't mean that it's changed us. We could truly understand something intellectually so that we understand all the arguments and can give all the arguments, rebut all the counter arguments. But what we're talking about with pranya and wisdom really is an understanding so deep that it changes us completely so that we are soaked in the understanding of the true nature of reality. And this takes us back to the, 20, the 20th, the final of the 20, solution, 20 suggestions for dealing with, over, uh, with overwhelm. Where Sandra says, the ultimate solution to overwhelm is awareness of emptiness. So that concludes what I have to say for this evening. And we can go through now to, to the next stage of our evening, where I'm going to lead a 
a meditative, reflective exercise on the five spiritual faculties. Now, although I've said that uh, ultimately pranya means being completely and utterly changed, uh, in alignment with the um, understanding that we have of the true nature of reality, we all have to start somewhere. And we, co we can all enjoy, we can all uh, experience pranya, samadhi, shraddha, virya, and shmriti uh, to some extent. We all begin somewhere. And that's really what I'd like to reflect upon during this next exercise. So we'll probably be sitting for about 20 minutes, I think. So if you'd like to make yourself comfortable in a meditative posture, And if you wish, allow your eyes to close. And become aware of your posture. Perhaps fine tuning. Aiming to have a posture in which you can sit comfortably for about 20 minutes. A posture that's relaxed, but alert, ideally. And becoming aware of your body. And you may experience one or two points of discomfort or ache, tiredness. But nevertheless, allow yourself to enjoy the experience of your body. Just being content to be embodied. Perhaps noticing the sound and the movement of your body as you breathe. Perhaps you can sense in some way your pulse as your heart beats.
So now bring to mind mindfulness or shmerti in your life. Where do you experience or practice mindfulness, shmerti in your life? Can you remember an event? Or is it something that you notice, you practice habitually? doesn't have to be a huge, life-changing event. Even the Buddha started somewhere. Mindfulness, shmirti. And now thinking about vigor, virya, energy in pursuit of the good. Where do you experience or practice virya in your life? Or where have you experienced virya in your life?
So now we move on to concentration, samadhi. Can you remember where you experience or practice concentration, samadhi? An event you can remember. Or a part of your practice. Can you think and experience concentration, samadhi? Where do you experience or practice faith, shraddha, in your life? Maybe one event that's occurred, perhaps it's habitual. It doesn't have to be a massive road to Damascus experience. So where you experience faith, Shraddha.
And finally, let's look at wisdom, pranya. Where do you experience or practice wisdom, pranya, in your life? Perhaps a one-off memory, perhaps from some time ago. Or perhaps something you do on a regular basis or experience on a regular basis. Thank you. 